So here's a rather extraordinary guy. My guest today is Vidusha, the founder and destiny architect of Luminary Learning Solutions in Sri Lanka. A great storyteller who takes his time to be the best he can be at all times. There's no middle ground with Vidusha. And his charming manner remains intact, even if he doesn't agree with you. Get ready for a jargon-free, no-nonsense chat about life and work and more life. So what, what you see behind me is um, my little way of preserving. Um, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for anything that is old. Um, so I like old books, old cupboards. Um, we, we kind of moved away from Colombo. So Anton is in Colombo. Um, right. And most of my life was in Colombo. But uh, we always wanted to get out of Colombo. So we came to Kandy because uh, Kandy, apart from Colombo, is about the only place that has decent enough schooling for the kids. So when, when Shakya finished O-Levels, we kind of moved. So I'm in Kandy, which is about uh, 120 kilometers away from Colombo. Uh, and I'm about 14 kilometers away from town in the middle of absolutely nowhere um, <laughs> with, with, with monkeys to keep me company. Um, so, <laughs> so, so but, but all, of this stuff, all of this stuff means absolutely nothing to anyone else apart from me because they're just little books and stuff from about three generations now. So I have my grandma's prize books from school, my uncle's um, books, uh, my mom used to be a secretary, so her first shorthand and typing manual, <laughs> all being framed because if you don't frame them, you lose them. That's true. You know what I mean? It'll be in some box somewhere or in a cupboard and nobody knows until it disintegrates. Um, so I had all of this stuff moving out. So I told myself, let's frame it. So we framed it and put it behind the wall. So on the wall. So that's, that's all you see. So all of this is just stuff from the past, including the first edition of the Reader's Digest. The oh. first, first one. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Beautiful. one of the first to get printed, um, which was in my granddad's library. So took it and framed it to remind me of him. So yeah, so that's what you see. I noticed you referred to O-Levels. So um, you are actually still in the British uh, kind of educational system, right? Very much, very much, yes. Okay. O-Levels, A-Levels and university. Well, your part of the world actually has so much history associated with the UK, which is where I'm from originally, you know, because I, I was born in Lancashire, just north mm -hmm. of Manchester. And um, I remember your country used to be called Salam. Correct. Yes, absolutely. And the, and the biggest um, thing that Salam was famous for was tea. Still is. <laughs> still, still is. is. We, haven't, we haven't moved too much in that department. We are still known for our tea. <laughs> to the point where I did go to uni in Hull um, um, for my bachelor's. And, and I remember people asking me, um, where are you from? And most of, the, most of the kids from my generation wouldn't know Sri Lanka. But the moment you go into my dad's generation, they, they, would, they would still raise an eyebrow and say, Sri Lanka, is that Ceylon? Ceylon, we know. <laughs> Sri Lanka, we don't know. <laughs> Ceylon, yes. <laughs> so yes, absolutely. And there's so many people that live there in this tiny place. This is, oh yeah. I mean, people have Insane. no idea that... Like it's over 21 million people live on this small spot. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Yep. Now, that's, that's... Um, just from a matter of interest, what's the state, the health state of, of um, Sri Lanka? I mean, you're aside. I mean, you know, you're off uh, India. India has had some very, very difficult times of late. Have you been struck by the same uh, problems with the pandemic? I, I think um, yes and no. Um, yes, we certainly have it. And we, as we speak, we, are, we have travel restrictions. So we're not exactly a lockdown, but we can't move between provinces. Um, but uh, for about six weeks, we couldn't actually go out of home unless you had a pass and such to go to work. They opened up the, um, 
grocery stores and everything else um, only about a few days back. Until then, it was only home deliveries. Um, but I think the issue with India, and I think we are in a way much better off because of it, is that we don't have the same levels of abject poverty that you would find in India, number one. And number two, our health sector is pretty good. Um, every single village would have a base hospital. Um, every province would have um, what we would call a provincial hospital. And um, quite apart from that, I think Sri Lankans by and large don't necessarily want to go to hospital. So we, we still have Ayurveda um, and, um, and it's not quacks, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, 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 um, it's not a quack doctor, but, but we, we have an institute which runs parallelly with, with, with Western medicine. We have the, the Ayurvedic medicine doctors being trained um, in Ayurvedic medicine where you get a license to be a doctor. Um, and that's a pretty intense course as much as being um, a proper doctor, doctor from a Western medicine perspective. Yeah. And because of that, and from, from, from a long time back, we've always had midwives. Um, they were part of the formal structure. Right. Um, so you would have people giving birth at home. Uh, most of the minor illnesses would be settled at home. They wouldn't necessarily come to hospital. Because of that, I think much of the pandemic didn't hit us as hard as it has India. Now, India doesn't have that infrastructure. We do. Now, if it gets really bad, then we have a problem because the infrastructure wouldn't be able to accommodate a mass influx of people coming into hospital for emergency care. But as long as the pandemic doesn't or the, the virus doesn't kind of incapacitate you and you require oxygen and all that and, and that number doesn't grow too large, I think we are fine because we would have home remedies and so on and so forth and the fever and whatever else that comes along with it will be managed at home. Yeah. So, so we are blessed that way to the point where actually I think because of that, our numbers don't get registered either <laughs> because nobody knows we have COVID, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, honest, honestly, they don't wow. because more, because more, where I live, it's, it's very much, a, I mean, it's a typical British Hamlet, if you like to call it that. So we are a bit like Devon or, you know, Stratford upon even yeah. little, um, you know, uh, places dotted around. Now, most of my neighbors have had COVID, right? We had a, a, a wedding um, and no matter what people say, you're going to come in for the alms givings or weddings and things like that. And the bride and the groom actually got it. Didn't tell anybody. N none of, ev almost everyone who came in for it got it. Um, but if you take a look at our statistics, so every week they kind of put up the statistics. Right. Our village is never mentioned as a place where there's COVID, right? So <laughs> that's because nobody knows. Nobody went and got their PCR test. They turn around and if somebody asks, they turn around and say, we have the cough and the cold and the flu and whatever else. And, and as long as they didn't die because of it, nobody knows. So there's none the wiser for it. <laughs> so I think, so, so if you're going by official statistics, I think we must be at least three times more than what we are projecting to, to have. Um, but but we, it gets managed. So I think we are blessed that way. Yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. Now, you know what's interesting about you, and I've because I've I've watched you in formal in formal settings, and and it, and informal settings, and yet even in formal settings, you still have this kind of um, quirky attachment to to some interesting language sound bites. Like you you often refer to things as being no nonsense, cut the crap. And you're like, and I'm thinking, where does this come from? Where is, how, where did he pick this stuff up? Like, how did he learn this stuff? <laughs> there's, there's one other one, uh, which is jargon free. Um, I think jargon free came first, simply because um, I've, and much to my own detriment and Anton, ever so often kind of, not only Anton, lots of people, including my mom, often tell me sometimes you just do need to kind of toe the line and I've never known how to. Um, 
I don't mean this disrespectfully, and that's I think the good news is that everyone who generally knows me knows that I don't I don't come from a place of disrespect. It's just that when when we studied management, I I went to uni to do history, <laughs> right? My life's ambition was to find the lost city of Atlantis, because I did Western classics and Greek and Roman civilizations for my A levels. Um, truth be told, got into Greek and Roman civilizations because there was a young lady teacher who turned up in our college to teach the subject. That was her first appointment after university, after graduating. Uh, her first teaching appointment was in our school, and our, ours was a proper Etonian-based um, British boarding school replicated in Sri Lanka, right? And in fact, the infrastructure of the school is mimicking um, Eton. So we have a quadrangle, and we have a chapel. Um, we have the college hall, the mess hall, the whole nine yards. So I, I came in there um, in grade five. We have a scholarship exam where you know um, in, in the fifth grade you can actually come into a better school, so to say, um, right. if you got good enough grades. So there was an opening in in St Thomas's. I sat for the entrance exam and got through, um, and went into St Thomas's right after that. And um, so I was introduced to this subject called Greek and Roman civilizations. And ever since then, I've always wanted to find the lost city of Atlantis. So I went to university. <laughs> yeah. After the first semester was done, um, there was like a career day kind of arrangement, right, for about a week. Um, and everybody came and spoke about all sorts of jobs and such, and nothing interested me because I wasn't necessarily into that, right? right. And in one of the forums, they actually asked me, and we had the ability to kind of have chats with career counselors and such. And when I went to meet one of them, they, they asked me, so what do you plan to do? <laughs> after you finish university and, and I kind of blurted out, I guess I'll have to find a job. Um, but I want, my ambition is to find the lost city of Atlantis. So, and, and she tried really hard to keep a straight face, right? <laughs> to say, are you serious about this? I'm, <laughs> I said, I am very serious. Okay, so, but let's, let's park that for a moment, the job. What, what kind of a job are you looking at? And I said, I have no idea. He said, well, you better think about it because if you're going to do history and major in archaeology, um, you're going to struggle to find a job. And I was very clear that I wanted to come back to Sri Lanka. I'm an only child, so, you know, um, and I always wanted to kind of make sure that I'm around when my parents get old. And I, it was very clear that they were not going to move out of Sri Lanka either. So, so that got me thinking. And, and then I went back to the council and asked her, okay, in which case, if I wanted to find a job, what would you have me do? I said, well, best thing to do is to do something like management. So I switched to management after that. <laughs> and, and, and then once I came back and started working, one of the biggest problems I had was to get to translate whatever I have learned into being meaningful at wherever I am. And it's not to say that theories don't apply. Of course, theories do, and, and they were very useful. But when you try and explain this to somebody who isn't from a management background, <clears throat> and we had a lot of people who didn't come from management backgrounds at work, it was very difficult because if you put a slide up and, and talked about theories of motivation or whatever it might be, it just didn't work. So, so hence came the little notion of jargon free. And um, one of my former bosses actually turned around and said, and he came from a completely non-management background. He was from Israel. He was part of Mozart. Um, queer twist of fate. Somehow he turned up as our boss. And um, he used to always turn around and tell us management is very, very simple. Management is simply observation, deduction, decision, reflection. Okay. Um, and I thought about it long and hard, and he, and he was right. And so I got to kind of, clearly enough, look at almost everyday life situations, call out the principles out of it, um, bring out how you can apply that principle, and started teaching management that way. And it stuck. And the cut the crap and no nonsense was was actually born out of the idea that, um, so we, we were called in once to kind of run assignment and we had to tabulate certain simple instructions, right? And we didn't have a title for it. 
and we called it no nonsense advice right um, and that's what it is it's just no no frills no flares no nothing just 1 2 3 4 5 if you want to do this here's how you go about that stuck as well cut the crap was simply because um we <laughs> most of our training programs people actually ask questions and 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 they want um cookie cutter answers or politically correct answers without actually reflecting on what reality was and nine times out of 10 if you didn't dissect that you actually did more harm than good in doing training programs so we called it cut the crap um simply because there is a certain Set. I'll give you an example of this. Um, take take the simplest of things. Like um, we just finished this session with um, on our on our webinar series, right? Um, and, and somebody asked the question. So, don't you think it's important for a leader to always make sure that people are looked after and people are happy? And and I know where they're coming from. but my argument has always been if you're working i don't think it's your boss's job to make you happy you know um if if that was a kpi we'll all fail it <laughs> <laughs> so Because, yeah making sure you're not unhappy that can be done making okay. sure you're not unhappy that we can okay. manage i can do that falling out of bed yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> but try and try and make an individual happy if if we could do that honestly in whatever form or shape i i, I think the entire human race would be a completely different ball game isn't it yeah we can't make people happy that you have to do for yourself but can we make sure that people are engaged and people are motivated and most people think that motivation also is the same as being happy it's not and in fact i think if you really look at it happy people aren't motivated because you're content you know so cut the crap was just that to understand that um you know most of what we call conventional wisdom doesn't hold true because we oversimplify something um simply because it's nice to say it um i have the same thing at home right and um when my kids were born i have a daughter who was born prematurely um and the doctors did say that she would probably have learning difficulties and she did um now my take on this and she came home one day um seven years old um and turned around and said that she was bullied in class um and i asked her what what were you you know how, how did you get bullied and she couldn't obviously understand certain theorems and principles that were there it took her a long while to figure out you know 2 and 2 makes 4 or after 2 comes 3 and before 2 comes 1 you know that just wouldn't compute inside her brain <laughs> so some kid has obviously blurted out you're a dumbass um and <laughs> and i remember and i remember we had major conversations about this at home with my wife and and my approach to my daughter was i i told her first of all accept the fact that you're a dumbass because if you're slow in picking up things um it's it's it's, it's what it is right i mean that's what and i said don't worry about it because i was one too um so chances are you would have got my genetic makeup <laughs> so you, you know um you being a dumbass is perfectly fine now what you do with it and should you limit yourself to that that's a different conversation and she said no no i don't want to limit myself i really want to get good grades and i told her look if you want to really get good grades and if you want to be an a student you probably will have to commit to 300 times more effort than an average kid and whether it's worth it or not is something you have to decide i can't decide that for you i'm perfectly fine if you just pass exams um but if you want to get straight as well then you have to understand that there's a huge amount of effort that needs to be put in and she said no no i want to really get good grades so we actually worked together for about 2 years and cut the crap is exactly what it was and i told her look you got to admit the fact first and foremost that you are not bright and in everyday parlance um, people will call you a dumbass you need to own that and be very proud about the fact that you're a dumbass and then what you do with that now just because you're bad at math doesn't mean that you have to be bad in languages 
or bad in music or in art. You know, find out where your gifts are and, and, and perfect that. But unfortunately, our school curriculum system is pretty rigid. Um, you have certain subjects which are mandatory. Maths is one of them. Um, I said, just pass this up. And she did pretty well, you know, um, and, um, and she's doing psychology now and um, she's perfectly fine. But my point is, there's no point sugarcoating this and trying to kind of get her to um, be, as, as most people would say, you know, motivate her and do all of this. And I think it's counterproductive because you've got to confront the fact that I have a limitation. Uh, how do I rise beyond my limitation can only happen if you accept the fact that you have a limitation. Otherwise, how can you rise above anything? And it's, it's really funny, you know, I'm listening to you and I'm, I'm thinking about some parents that might be listening to you and saying, oh my God, this guy's like, he's a rebel. He's a, a rogue. He's like, he's, he's coming at things with such uh, a no nonsense kind of approach. And, uh, and is that right? I mean, is, is that a real benefit for the, the student or, or the audience that you're teaching? I mean, I, I'm sure that there are more naysayers to your approach than there are supporters. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very respectful of that, Peter, because genuinely, um, and this is me as a parent in a very specific context, that context wouldn't work with everyone. Now, he, if I break it down, the first thing is that you, you must have a child who wants to progress, right? Um, that's where it all starts. She wanted to get good grades. I wasn't pushing her to get good grades because I wanted to, her to get good grades. She wanted it for herself. The second is that you have to understand that if you are taking this stance, you have to be willing to commit time. So I would sit with Shakya from six o'clock, I'll finish work, come home at about six, 6.30, take a shower. And we will work sometimes till 12 o'clock midnight every day, right? Because what somebody would take an hour to grasp, she would take three. And you can't stop this halfway and you have to see it through. So you must be willing to put in that time and effort. And not everyone has the luxury of being able to do that. My vocation would allow me to do that, but. But, um, but um, you know, some people can't, right? And, and, and you need to be respectful of that. And the third thing is that there's a fine line that you need to talk. And there is no guidebook on this. And even my own parents turned around and told me, look, you need to go slow because you, you might be pushing her too far. And my answer to that, because I'm her father and I can take that decision for myself, is that if... I had to make a choice between my daughter turning around and saying, you are a right royal. <laughs> and she also, but, um, and I hate you. But she graduated from a um, fantastic life, is doing really, really well. Or she loves me dearly and you, you know thinks the world of me but she didn't do much in life because she was ill-equipped to do so. If I had to make a choice between the two, I would always want to make sure that she is successful in whatever she chooses to do. If, and if the cost of that is her hating me, so be it. Now, if I can do both, obviously that's the reality, that's the best possible outcome you can have and, and you should go for it. But sometimes you don't have the luxury of it. And all I said was, um, I have enough time, and she was just seven, I have enough time to make her my friend um, later on. There are many ways of getting across that, right? But if somebody doesn't prepare her for the realities that's going to come, say, for example, um, school did offer her what you call the special units class, right, for kids with special needs. And I refused to put her there simply because I told the teachers, I don't think... Um, she's that weak, for starters. And secondly, I don't think in life, when you go into life as an adult, there's no special unit in life. There isn't, right? I mean, are you going to cut slack for her simply because she has special needs? It's not going to work that way. Yeah. So the earlier I prepare her to deal with it and equip her with the skill sets that are required for that, I think the better it is. 
Now, of course, there is a load of love, a lot of understanding and a lot of compassion that needs to go with it, of course. But there's no real nice way of doing this. I wish she wasn't born like that. Um, I wish, um, you know, I wasn't born like that because I struggled with mathematics myself. Um, but that's what it is, right? The faster you come to grips with it, the better it is. But, but I'm deeply respectful that it might not work in all circumstances. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm very aware of that. Yeah. But I do think, and this happens at work also, Sometimes you have people who are wonderful people who are just ill-equipped to do what they have chosen to do. And at some point, I think it's in their best interest if you call it out, as gut-wrenching though it may be. Um, give you another example. Right? So I, I wanted to play basketball um, when I was small. My, my ambition at the time when I was about 13, 14 years old was to play at the NBA. I was no good at it. I really wasn't. Um, I was not athletic in any form. I was far too slow. I couldn't dribble the ball well enough. I couldn't shoot. Um, I could shoot, but it wouldn't go inside the ring. Um, so there was no basket to be had. <laughs> so, but I went for practice every single day for three, almost three years in a row. But I never, never played. Um, I was always on the bench um, right? because I just wasn't good enough. Now, at one point, my coach sat me down and said, Vidusha, I, I, I love your enthusiasm. I love your tenacity. But I need to tell this to you. You'll never be good enough to play in the team. And it just completely broke my heart. Um, I came back home. I cried a lot. And then I told myself, I will show him. And I practiced doubly hard. I got a couple of friends to help me out. But I had two big flaws. One was that I couldn't jump. Um, you know, we Sri Lankans or most, most of us um, who are Buddhist would believe in rebirth and such. So I, I think in my previous life, I was an elephant. Elephants can't jump either. Um, so, <laughs> so it continued to plague me in this birth as well, even though I had only two legs. <laughs> so, so I couldn't jump. Um, I wasn't tall enough. Um, I, wasn't, I didn't have dexterity, all of which are essential ingredients to be a good basketball player. And my ambition wasn't to play in the school team. My ambition was to play in the NBA. Good luck with that, right? <laughs> so, so my coach called me out on this and I, and I sat down and um, I reflected on it. And I went for practice and practiced doubly hard. And then on one fateful match, he allowed me to play. And in the five minutes that I was playing, I realized that the other team was catching up. We had a healthy lead, um, very, very healthy lead. But I was messing it up so badly that they were scoring with such ease that the margin was narrowing very, very rapidly. And then it stuck. And, and then it struck me really hard to say that I'm being an impediment to the team. And I called time out. I told my coach to kind of, you know, substitute me. I sat on the bench. Um, and that day I decided, look, this is not for me. Um, and as, as hard as it was, it, it was a very, very bitter pill to swallow. But as hard as it was, I think he was right by me in calling it out. Many years later, um, um, I got the opportunity to kind of um, get into debating. And um, all of the practices that we went through and the structure and the discipline that came along with it helped me tremendously in that chosen vocation. And I did fabulously well in it. Um, so I think sometimes we try really hard because we are passionate about something, but we don't have the skill set required to do it, to, to, to do it well. You, you can have fun doing it, but you won't be doing well in it. Mm -hmm. And at work, we make this horrible mistake of thinking of potential. Potential means nothing if it's not realized. And sometimes you do not have the skill set to truly um, fulfill your potential because you're in the wrong field or in the wrong slot. And if as a manager or as, as a leader, you don't call it out, you're doing him great injustice. And I think that principle remains true. So even though it's very unpopular, I honestly think it's, it's best for people if somebody comes and says to you, 
this is just not for you. It's not working out. There's nothing wrong with you. You're a fantastic chap. You have other skills that you might be able to exploit, but this just isn't working out for you. And I think you need to be able to take that. And if, you, if there's enough trust build, and if you genuinely know that the other person is coming from a place of love, I think there's a conversation to be had. And it's an important conversation to have. So I'm respectful of the fact that it's not for everyone. I'm respectful of the fact that it might not be what mainstream would say. But I think, certainly for my daughter, I really did think it was the right thing to have been done. Wow. You know, I'm listening to you. And I had a question in the back of my mind that already planned for you. Because one of the... Um, one of the quirky things, <laughs> I know you're the founder of Luminary Learning Solutions, but you've also got an and, which is the destiny architect. Now, if, if somebody was to be literal about destiny and architect, destiny, I think people still think, oh, that's kind of a presupposed kind of end result that I'm, you know, that I'm going to uh, meet based on karmic, a karmic solution of some sort. And then architect is a builder. So I, which in a sense, or a designer and builder. And so I'm thinking like, okay, so this guy designs destinies, but destinies are supposed to be kind of already yeah. presupposed. So, but I'm listening to you talk and then all of a sudden I start to realize how those, how you are weaving those two things together, and, and, and probably why you maybe even chose that title. I'm only assuming at this stage now. I'm going to, I'm going to let you explain to us uh, 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 why you even use that. But I can sense this thing about, you know, taking what you've got and working it. Is is that why? Is that why you came up with that title for yourself? Is <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I, I first, when I first started out High Five, which is the parent company of Luminary, I called myself the cheerleader um, because I thought, you know, as a startup, that's the first thing I, I needed to do. I needed to cheer people on, um, on the path. Destiny Architect um, is, is I, I think there are two ways of looking at destiny. The first is that it is preordained. The other is the proverbial saying the destiny is in your own hands. Um, now, I think both are true. I think both are true. And one without the other is meaningless. Right? So I think, I think there is something, I mean, as I said, you know, um, coming from a Buddhistic tradition, um, I, my, my family is weird um, in the sense that, you know, there, there, there are juxtapositions all around. So um, my mom's dad was a Christian. My mom's mom was a very devout Buddhist. When they got married, both of them got kicked out of their own homes um, simply because they married out of faith, um, right? Um, so <laughs> they were both kicked out of home. Um, and they raised their children, my mom and three other siblings, to actually learn both faiths and were allowed at 18 to choose their own path. Um, and because of that, I have a lot of books lying around of all the traditions. Um, we have the Quran at home, we have the Tripitaka at home, we have the Bhagavad Gita at home, um, we have the Bible at home. So growing up like that, I realized that both of them have, have truth in it. Um, there are certain, lots of things that you just can't explain. Right? Um, you can't really rationalize why certain things happen to you. At the same time, what we do with whatever we've got is purely up to us. Nobody else can influence that. Absolutely nobody else can influence that. If you're able to think and rationalize for yourself, and if you're able to connect with who you are and what you can do in any given circumstance, I think there is a liberation that comes along with it. Now, an architect, even though we think about it from the perspective of, um, you know, being, yes, it is a builder, but even an architect doesn't have a perfect situation. Sometimes you get a very small parcel of land to build a house in, but the expectation of that house is huge. You want to have seven rooms and 
um, you want to have a you know pool, you know all of that in just seven perches of land. On the other hand, you might have two acres of land, but all of it is on a, a, a rocky outcrop. What do you do at that point? So I don't think any architect actually gets a piece of land that is completely conducive to the type of building he's trying to build. He has to weave something in. There is something in their mind. What comes out as an architectural drawing has to be changed and will be changed multiple times in the building process because circumstances aren't perfect. But the important thing is whatever you have as your vision in your head as a sketch, as a schematic, sees fruition in spite of the limitations that you have. Sometimes you don't have the right budget. Sometimes you don't have the right uh, skilled personnel to execute it. But you navigate through all of this and realize what you had in your mind in the building that you um, have. So I think destiny is very much that. You don't necessarily control all the pieces that are required to make it happen. But you're in control certainly of what you do and how you react and whether you have the tenacity to keep at it. But here's the thing. You also, on the other hand, have to be brave enough with the same example of basketball to turn around and say, this can't be done. And it's okay. Right? And, and you find, and I think it wasn't basketball that I wanted to play. That was my passion. That was my liking. Yes. But I think what I wanted was to be part of something meaningful, part of something great, part of being a success. And you can find success in many other avenues. It doesn't have to be basketball. So if the overarching purpose was the same, how you arrive at it, I think, is, is situational. So if it wasn't basketball, it could have been cricket, it could have been football, it could have been debating, it could have been chess. It doesn't really matter. Um, and all I wanted to do was to win the championship. So um, the same thing is true of life itself overall as an organization also. So as long as you understand that you never are um, in control of everything, but you are in control of something, and you home in on that, I think you do become a destiny architect. Um, and you can fulfill whatever ambition or um, purpose that you had in mind for yourself, provided you're willing to navigate through it and understand that not everything is going to go your way. So destiny, I think, is something that you can fulfill for yourself, provided you're willing to navigate through it. That's awesome. Where, where was the idea of luminary um, learning solutions um, kind of, what was the genesis of that? Like what, what made you, because you've been at this now for three or four years and, and I'm wondering like, like you, you didn't just like dream that up. You probably bumped into something that, that you know, was a cause and effect. Uh, tell us about the development of that organization. Okay, so luminary... Um, started out as an offshoot of High Five Consulting. Um, so I was about 28. Um, I decided to kind of um, quit corporate life for very personal reasons. I, I really enjoyed my work and I had some great bosses and a great team. But it, it somehow took a lot of time out of me. And um, I, I did decide to kind of call it a day and take a look around to see whether I could do another job. Um, starting out on my own was never on the cards. It was something that just happened. And what happened was I, I took a six months off just to spend time at home. My daughter was about two years or three years old and, and told myself, I'll take six months off. I was young enough to get back to work. So I was 28. Um, and um, in those six months, people called me up and said, look, you know, Vidusha, um, heard about some of the work that you've done. Can you come and help us out? Um, and one assignment led to another assignment. Um, I wasn't, you know, in Sri Lanka, we have something called pay tax when you're employed. Right? So the employer, the employer pays the tax on your behalf and deducts it off your salary. Right. But now all of a sudden I was still having an income coming in, but no tax being paid. And, you know, 
the tax man did call me up and turn around and say, look, you're not paying tax. And I said, I didn't know I had to because the company that was, you know, was taking care of it. So they said, come over. And we, I, I went across and said, look, this is what I'm doing. Um, tell me what I'm supposed to do. And they turned around and said, look, the best thing for you is to start a company because otherwise you have to pay on income. But if you have a company, you actually pay on profit. Um, and, and your books will be very clean after that. You don't have to kind of necessarily um, jump through too many hoops for it. So the company was set up simply to make sure that the tax file was maintained. <laughs> what? That's, that's what, there, was, there was no grand vision oh whatsoever. But then what happened was one assignment led to another. In between, lots of people called in because lots of the work that we were doing was an organizational development and organizational renewal. And most of it actually hinged on improving middle management tiers in order to execute some of the uh, recommendations that were coming in. And many of my clients wanted me to do leadership development programs. So we curated a few programs and that kind of turned out to be quite well. And we tweaked it and then we came up with a couple of models around it and it stuck. And for nearly 12 years, we only did long-term leadership programs, pegged to more change initiatives, or more consultative and change initiatives. And we didn't do anything else. But again, the organization started growing. And lots of our clients wanted us to do other forms of training as well. And for nearly 10 years, we resisted that and said, no, we are not doing that simply because I'm, I'm not a jack of all trades, right? I don't know some of these. Just because you can talk about something doesn't mean you become a trainer in that. I, I, I certainly don't believe that, right? So Luminary came up simply because there was so much of pressure to get into other areas of training that we decided it's best to start a unit completely dedicated towards training. So about three years ago, we set up a um, unit under High Five and um, we kind of called on people to say, if you're interested, come and join. And all of a sudden there was an overwhelming kind of um, um, demand for it. And lots of people came in and we set up the company. And um, what happened was when we were just about to go to market, because we did a lot of training for our trainers, uh, prepped them up on how the process works and all of that. Um, and then COVID happened um, when we were just taking off. And then it was a beautiful time for us personally, honestly, because it enabled us to pivot and take most of what we did online in person, which enabled us to reach a much bigger audience than what we would have traditionally had. And the beauty of it was the fact that whether it was online or whether it was in person, the process that you adopt makes a difference. And most of the time, there is a myth to turn around and say, you can't teach online as effectively as you would do in person. But that is only true if you don't design a program to be online. The issue is we try and take something that is done physically and transplant it into being on a virtual platform. That doesn't work. But if you design a process around an online platform, you can have the same effect and the same impact and the same result that you would get out of it. And... Um, I think that did very, very well. And we were able to, uh, I think call to fame was always to be able to have ROI after our leadership programs. And we were able to do that online as well. So because of that, today, as we speak, you have an entire series of programs that are completely online. There is a series of programs that are completely in person. And there are another series of programs which actually has the best of both worlds where it's a hybrid model where certain aspects are done online and certain aspects that are done in person and all of them are picked to ROI um, which is awesome so that's how that came about so there was no real grand vision it just became an evolutionary thing that is remark you can't make that up that was remarkable and I, I agree with you about um, this pandemic I, I've said it often it flattened the world we live in. And I've said to many people, this has been such a great time to start a business because even as a single entity, you can publish and produce your thought leadership to the world, right? Because the world mm -hmm. is listening. We're all online. We're all on Zoom. We're all on YouTube. I mean, it. That's all we're doing because we can't do anything else, right? <laughs> Correct. 
Absolutely. Oh. And I think provided you were able to sift through the modalities of it, I, I think the world is closer than ever before because of it. And for nearly three months, we were locked down at home, not being able to even step out into the road. Um, and if you could pivot during that time, um, all of a sudden you have an audience that you would have never had otherwise. So I sense also that you've created, um, around Luminary, you've created a bit of an ecosystem of specialists that you've drawn in and, and involved in the organization. Tell us more about the, uh, the, the makeup of that. Okay. So <laughs> here's a funny thing, right? My dad is a, um, he was in the university service for 37 long years. And he's a product of free education. Sri Lanka has free education right up until um, your master's level and beyond if you wanted to. And it's completely free, as in absolutely free. So he benefited from that greatly. And he's always believed that education and knowledge should be free. It's one of his uh, mantras. And when I started doing training and consulting, um, I'm an unashamed capitalist. Um, <laughs> and, and my dad would often chide me for it um, because both my mom and dad, I think, are socially spent. Um, <laughs> and, and my dad used to often tell me, look, I don't think what you're doing is right. I, I, I think you're selling knowledge, you're selling skills and, and that benefits people and you're doing it for the highest bidder. Um, only people who could afford you can benefit from you. And that's wrong. Um, and, and, and this always bugged me, always. Um, so when we started out at High Five, I, I thought about it long and hard. And we came up with a simple principle that we would share 50% of our net earnings with anyone who works with us. And that continues to this date. So even when we talk about Luminary, all of the trainers that work with us if, if, for example, they run a one-day training program, and let's say we charge $100 for it, um, and, and this, let's, let's say there's about $5 or $10 of you know, expenses that goes into the equipment and the material and all of that, the $90 that gets remained gets split right in half. So $45 goes directly to the trainer. And $45 gets retained inside the organization um, and, and would you know, go into funding everything else. And myself included um, would earn that way. So we made sure that the principle, the overarching principle behind it was that you would be rewarded for the contribution you make um, versus who you were inside the organization. Now inside, of course, you have senior trainers and junior trainers um, and how we charge out to the client would depend on whether you're a senior trainer or a junior trainer, but the principle of, um, sharing the 50% remains exactly the same. So whatever we build, minus expenses, 50% is shared with the trainer. And what we did was we brought in people who had three things. The first was you had to be a person who has actually worked. Um, because we are not teaching academics. We are teaching professionals who are meant to perform and bring in a result. And it's very difficult to empathize with that. Not that you can't, but it's very difficult to empathize with the person who's working and the context they're in, unless you've been through it in, in, in the same setting. So you have to have worked at least at a management capacity. And you, it is mandatory that you have performed well in that function. That's one. The second is that you must be willing to learn. Um, and we make the horrible mistake of thinking that we are subject matter experts. We are not. Um, and, um, and we always argue whenever we go for a program, we always tell them we are not trainers, we are learning facilitators. And the simple rule book is that if you have roughly about 30, 35 participants in an audience and each of them had worked for just say two years, you have 60 years of tacit knowledge amongst them. No trainer will have 60 years of tacit knowledge. So because of that, we believe that peer learning needs to be facilitated as much as trainer-led learning. 
So we split up the time to make sure that, yes, we bring something to the party. We will impart that. But we will also facilitate you learning from the person next to you and across you as much as from the person who's the so-called trainer. So you must be willing to learn. You can't really kind of pull out this stunt by saying, I am a subject matter expert, so therefore thou shalt listen. That's two. And the third is that you must be willing to kind of impart whatever you know towards somebody else as well. So for example, each of our training programs, whenever we run programs, we have a peer review taking place. And you are expected to learn from your peer all the tricks of the trade. And they're expected to learn from you all your tricks of the trade. And you're not expected to keep something behind saying that is my signature move, so to say. You know? You're expected to teach that to somebody else. So as long as you fulfill these three, you come on board as one of our learning facilitators. And we onboard them. And we make sure that each one of them specializes in one or two, maximum three areas. So that we are each specialists of a particular area. All of us might be able to talk about it, but only they will facilitate a program. So that's how that gets done. So the broad principle of it is that we are not necessarily employees. Um, we have a very loose document called the way we work, um, where we list out in absolutely simple terms what it means to be inside the organization. Um, we sign off on it. It's not a legally bounding document. It's an honorable agreement between two individuals. And say, if we commit to this, we are part of the team. And that's how we operate. So we, we are lucky that we are in this space. You can't do this with every industry, in, with every organization. Of course, we can't. But we have the liberty of being able to do it because we are in the knowledge industry. Um, we can afford to have a slightly different approach to organizational dynamics. And it's worked really well. So we have about 25 plus trainers now um, who work with us. And um, I think it works because each of us can become the very best versions of ourselves versus competing with each other to turn around and say, I am the best trainer. That's awesome. Like you've broken the mold on how you even think about the business itself. You've broken the mold on the development of it. And, and I see you doing other things. I mean, it, it, you, you, you're, you're not just focused on like building tutorials and taking people through uh, a series of uh, learning sessions, but you, you actually build out the content and the facilitators guides and, the, and, and even the thought leadership after the fact. It's almost like you're like a, you're almost like a learning publishing house. That's what it looks like from my, per like I'm looking at it from the outside and I'm thinking like, what is this? Is, it, is this a person who knows what they want to be when they grow up or are they just want to be everything? Uh, you know, I mean, but I really like the fact that they're extensions of one another because I, I know I've read some of your guru guides and I've read some of your perspectives and I've read some of your cut the crap uh, uh, you know sessions and I'm thinking like wow like this is so different my biggest question when I see all this is how is the traditional business corporate business receiving you what kind of what kind of things have you have you come up against when you're trying to position yourself with maybe someone who needs L and D. Sure. So on, on generally when we work, we always tell our clients that we, we are deeply respectful, Peter, of the fact that each organization must decide for themselves what is best for them. We are not here to tell them what is best. Uh, once again, this is something that was deeply ingrained in me by one of my former bosses. When I, in my you know, formative years at work, I used to get very frustrated about how things were and I wanted to always change it and so on and so forth. And he sat me down one day and said, there's nothing wrong with you wanting to change things. But um, you need to understand that at the same time, there's nothing wrong with you wanting to change things. There's nothing wrong with someone wanting to keep it as it is. 
be respectful of that and it it really resonated with me because i think one of the biggest problems we have is that we are very passionate about what we do we don't want to give the same credence to somebody who's equally passionate about something completely opposite to you uh, and that's fine too right um there's nothing wrong with a progressive organization there's nothing wrong with a traditional organization as well both can do superlatively well so we decided long years ago when we set up itself that it is not our place to tell you what you need to be once you have decided what you need to be let us try and co-create how you get there now if we feel what you need to be is detrimental to you we'll call it out but the final decision is yours very much like a child i mean if 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 we see one of our sons or daughters or children going on a direction that we think is not right for them that doesn't suit them we'll call it out but it's their decision to make ultimately it's not ours to make um, we can guide that conversation we can give input to that conversation ever so often we can do a little bit of arm wrestling as well but <laughs> but but after all of that is done it is their decision to make so when we approach lnd we generally tell organizations that you decide what kind of a culture you want to create once you've decided that let us come and help you through how to arrive at that destination and learning and development plays a huge role in the whole culture development piece so starting out from designing a competency framework to coming up with a training needs analysis to curating programs to executing those programs to reviewing those programs and then of course looking at the impact on the organization behavior and performance and linking all of that towards the overall direction the organization is taking is the scope of work we undertake having said that some organizations don't want us to handle all of that they want us to only run a program and that's fine at the same time thankfully there are many organizations who actually listen to all of this and say look that makes a lot of sense let's go with it and then we start from scratch and and take them through that journey with us so honestly we've not necessarily had a roadblock so to say in whatever we do simply because we've always felt it's not our place to tell them what to do whatever they decide to do our job is to make sure that they succeed once they have decided what to do um so in that sense we take a rather different approach to a client and us relationship yeah that's very good that's very good so i mean you take a more collaborative approach there's no question about that and 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 and, and you never you never force feed your clients that's that's the other thing too right i mean you know they say you can take a horse to water you can't make him drink right you know and 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 that resonates all the way through your conversation or even right back from the beginning because and even i I've, i've listened to some of your online sessions and it it's really funny you know how you are precise rich in language and then you still default to this like no nonsense approach to doing things like and it's quirky i have to tell you that like but it's a, i appreciate it it's refreshingly quirky it like it meets me on so many levels you have no idea because i'm thinking why 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 haven't we been more like this in 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 the in the companies in the big corporations why why can't corporations afford to be more practical and more down to earth and more realistic i mean what in your mind what do you think gets in the way of this the progress that you can get from simplicity <laughs> thank you for saying that respectfully <laughs> but 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 here's the thing peter right i think the biggest issue that we have is a misunderstanding of intent i think the moment we turn around and say you are quirky or you're a rebel or you're a mudcracker and so on and so forth you have a negative connotation to it right 
and people take offense in it. So the first thing is, if you want reform in any organization, and I'm talking about being inside an organization rather than being a consultant to it. If you're inside an organization, I think, first of all, you need to be respectful of the fact that if you want reform, you need to galvanize support. Correct? In, in its essence, you, you cannot have reform without support. The only other alternative to that is to be a radical or a usurper. Now, that will work, provided you actually make it to the top. I always turn around and say, you know, you're a terrorist only until <laughs> you take over the country. <laughs> Once you do, um, you're president, right? You are no longer called a terrorist. No, you're a president of a country at that point. Um, so if you are causing a revolution, you better win it. You have to win it or you get shot. Those are the only two options available for, for a radical, right? You either win or you lose your life. I've often wondered about this simply because when I used to work, I've always seen things that could improve. And I used to always question my bosses as to why it isn't improved. And, and, and I soon realized that actually the problem was me. Now, what do I want? Right? What do I want? Now, if I want simply to make a problem or, or to create a problem or to kind of be the epicenter of it. That's one approach to take. The other is to understand, I want reform or I want to change what is happening inside the organization. I want to bring in simplicity. I want to make sure that the hierarchy is flattened, whatever it might be. In that case, you need to have three things working for you. The first is you need to be able to galvanize support from people. The second is that you must be able to prove logically and otherwise by proven results that your method is better. You can't be on a whim. There's far too much at stake, right? Just because you say so doesn't mean it's so. You have to prove that. And the third is, I think, the more difficult part, which is once you arrive at your destination or the end state, you must be willing to bring the detractors on board as well, rather than snub it in their face, because then there's always a backward reaction. And it's only a matter of time until you fail all over again. Now, if you wanted to do that, how you would go about it is very different. You'll take a long-term approach. You're not taking a short-term approach. You will involve people. And very, very importantly, you will ensure that you demonstrate by word and deed that you're not out there to personally take a pot shot at a person. You remove the personification of the problem. And you attack the problem without ever causing disrespect or harm to an individual. The moment you know how to do that, you crack the code. So genuinely, the reason why organizations don't do enough of this is the people who want change almost always butt heads with the traditional core. Let me give you an example of this as well, right? Imagine, forget, forget organizations. Let's just, just forget organizations for a moment. Try and convince your mother and father when you're 16 years old that you want to go for an all-night party <laughs> where there's alcohol involved. Now, <laughs> I don't think that's, that's not, a, not an easy battle to fight. And you might stand on your head and turn around and say, it's my God-given right to be able to go. And your parents will stand on their heads and turn around and say, well, you're under my house um, and wait until you're 21 and do whatever you like. But as long as you're here, this is the way it will be. It's a never ending struggle, isn't it? Now, you have two ways of doing this. You can either go anyway and suffer the consequences later on. One option it becomes very um, <laughs> an awful situation to be in, right? It's, it's unpleasant. Um, and life is too short to be unpleasant all the time, isn't it? I mean, especially with the people who are closest to you. The second is to take a little bit of time and convince your parents that you're adult enough to handle that situation. Not by saying so, 
but by doing so. So if you are able to keep your room clean, if you are able to do your studies by yourself, if you can make sure that you're sensible in how you approach things, your parents at some point is going to turn around and say, you know what, give him a chance and see. Um, and let's see what happens. That's what you need in organizations as well. So you need to be able to build that credibility about yourself to say, I am doing this genuinely, not because I want to be having platitudes for myself, but because I genuinely feel the entire organization will do better because of this. Now, if we as the change agents take that approach, I think there'll be a lot more acceptance of change that comes rather than hitting a stone wall, so to say. You're so, um, you've got this nucleus about you. Like, I, I, it, it doesn't matter what you speak about. You have this storytelling nucleus and you seem to always draw back. I like that. I think, I think that's possibly why people like to you. You know, I think people come to you and people work with you because you've got this grounding. You've got this personal grounding that, like, I ask you about corporate you go back to life. I ask you about a, another business situation. You go back to life. I mean, I like that because I'm all about you being your brand. You know that. That's, that's my, you know, and, and I wish more leaders would actually realize that if they took themselves back in that journey to that nucleus of who they are, they would do far better in, in, in the business world? I think so too, because genuinely, I think um, I, must, I, I must have a small caveat to that. I, I, I think it's, it's important to be able to draw the distinction between in the way you run an organization is, is, is obviously different to how you would run home, of course. Right. Um, having said that, I think the principles of what governs us and what brings about success is fundamentally the same, irrespective of what you look at. I can take something completely unrelated. Just, just, take, just take trees and, 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 and agriculture or whatever, right? The principle of success there is, is the same. You do need to prepare the soil. You can't really go and take a coconut and send it to Siberia and tell it to grow. It, it can't. It needs the environment that is required in the tropical you know, environments for it to grow. There's nothing wrong with the coconut, isn't it? Um, there's nothing wrong with Siberia either. Nope. It's just that coconut and Siberia don't mix. <laughs> you know. So the issue is, I honestly think this is the issue. The crux of the issue is we've seen a coconut and we think it's fantastic, but we want it to grow in Siberia. Now, you can make it grow in Siberia. But then you need to invest in the infrastructure for it to be able to do that. And you will need to have, you know, the greenhouses and, you know, climate control and temperatures and all the rest of it. So I think the principles of whatever you talk about remains fundamentally the same. So, yes, there is a difference between, you know, being a CEO of an organization and being a father at home. Of course, there is. But the fundamental principles of it runs true, uh, irrespective of what you do. But to me, the bigger issue is the fact that I am still me. And whatever I do, this is all part of my life. And if I'm going to kind of crack it and segment it by saying, okay, this is my work life. This is my family life. This is my you know, role as a father. This is my role as a CEO. And this is my role as a son or whatever. I think at some point you're going to get confused isn't it? because there are far too many variables at play on this. So I think the safest way to live life is to be yourself. Um, but having said that, the only caveat to that I will throw at people is that I often tell people, you saying I am me shouldn't be an excuse. It shouldn't be an excuse for you not to rise up, not to better yourself, not to challenge yourself, not to be more, not to do more. That should not be an excuse. This is me. This is all I, th that shouldn't be an excuse. It should be an acceptance. And once you've accepted that, you grow, you naturally grow um, because you're drawing in on from everything that is happening around you. And because of that, and if you're open to that suggestion, 
then you can seamlessly bring anything that happens to you in life into a given situation and i think that's the best thing that can happen to any human being but since you brought this up i must tell you a small story i wasn't always like this i mean people do know me and you said that i'm likable and this is probably because pe- why people gravitate towards me i i, I was a completely different person about you know 15 20 years ago and the reason why it changed was i was very competitive and i and i still am i'm i'm very competitive and and i no make no apologies for it i really do want to do more be more on a constant basis and i get very bored if i'm not but one of my defining moments from a career perspective was i had a manager who was nearly 52 years old at the time her name was sepalika and sepalika was the one who recruited me right as a management trainee and um and when the time came both of us she was an assistant manager at the time and i rose um to being an assistant manager myself she was heading human resource management and i was heading human resource development and there was a vacancy for a overall head of hr and i didn't apply for it simply because you know sepalika was obviously the most senior person for it now sepalika proposed my name and my managing director called me up and gave me the job and i told look you know what about sepalika and you know um what am i supposed to do and she turned and he turned around and smiled and said look sepalika is the one who proposed your name um, she wanted you to have the job so i went back to my desk um called sepalika into the room and i said look this is awkward um i was 24 at the time 25 at the time she was 52 so she was twice my age um and she had more experience than my living years um in the job and i said look i y- you know i heard that um, you had proposed my name and you had said that i could do a good job thank you for that but i don't know whether i should take this up and she smiled at me and turned around and said look you have 25 plus years ahead of you i have just three my job is to make sure that you succeed so take the job and whatever support you need from me i will give it so i literally became her boss and she had to report through to me and she did it with such grace and poise and she supported me right through until i left um she's still around she still um, works for the organization and comes in on a, a consultative basis and that one lesson truly defined to me what leadership ought to be and if ever i become overtly competitive at the cost of someone else i'm always reminded of sepalika and i ask myself i would be doing great injustice for that beautiful um gesture of goodwill that she did um and i root myself with it so i do think i'm very blessed to have had bosses like that who genuinely wanted me to succeed and genuinely wanted to make sure that even at their cost um that i would succeed and i think that's beautiful when that happens to you um so so i kind of do that in her honor now um so i do honestly believe that the best thing i can do is to make sure that if ever i see someone who's really good to ensure that they truly fulfill their potential and if they do better than me that's great um it's not a threat it's not a you know slap in the face or it's not um, whatever you want to call it um but it's possibly the best thing that can happen isn't it um that you had some small part to play in the great journey they undertake so so that's on sepalikan not on me wow what a story oh my gosh like um i've got to tell you that that nugget that piece right there is worth the whole hours time we've spent together like really that is that is a very very important lesson you know because so many people you know get caught up in themselves right and being more important than others and i say i don't recognize that in you but now i understand right because you you've been given and you've just uh, shared with us this absolutely amazing example of that i i really appreciate that that's been absolutely fantastic wow i i i don't i, I don't know how you can top that in all honesty listen i am cognizant of time 
we have been together for a little while, uh, for a little over an hour now. And I, I want to say, and I know it's later for you, but I want to appreciate, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you. It's on a Saturday. Not at all. Thank you very much for having me. I know it's been really, really great. Uh, Anton is um, uh, uh, quite a guy. I've, uh, you know, he, he, he and I have been kind of banging heads a little bit on, on LinkedIn. We've had chats, we've had push and shove sessions and, you know, and so always along the lines of collaboration and always along the lines of development. And, and you know, I can see Luminary, you know, has a big future ahead of it just based on the nucleus and the reasons and the purpose that you've, that, you know, that you've built into, uh, into the organization. So, you know, you're to be congratulated on that because you really are doing something that I think no one else is doing in a learning and development capacity. That's for sure. Thank you. But it makes it so much easier when you have people like Anton and the entire team around it. And um, we have an ops team with um, Buddhima and Mahesha. Um, and there's a whole host of trainers who, it, it's very easy to get lofty about your ideals. It's another thing to find others who resonate with it. Um, and I think this is where luck comes into play. I've been very lucky that way throughout my career. That I've always found people who resonate with that ethos. Um, if that doesn't happen, nothing happens, uh, right? So in my career, I had Bimsara and Sajit who supported me, Mallika, and you know, there's countless others. But the moment you have a group of people who truly believe in the ethos, having an argument is easy because you come from the same place. That that and that enriches you. The moment you don't come from the same ethos. That's when conflict becomes personal. Um, and that's when it becomes very difficult to drive organization. So I think if Luminary has had any success, um, it's, I, I think it's less important to start things. It's more important to grow things. Starting something, even a plant, right? I mean, I don't have green fingers either. My mom does. Whatever she sticks it plants. I, I have sat down and tried to plant trees all my life. All of it dies. Um, <laughs> so I've given up on it. <laughs> so, so my you mother are, tells yeah. me, <laughs> my mother tells me all the time, that's because you don't believe in the plant. I said, Ma, I can't believe in the plant. You know, <laughs> you know, it, you, you well, kind of it, put it on. Two the things, that's two things you know you're not. You're not a basketball <laughs> player and you're not a gardener. <laughs> but thankfully, when it comes to the teams I've had the pleasure of working with, I've always been lucky to kind of find people who've really, really, really got grounded in the ethos that we all believe in. So if there are any kudos to be had, you know, it, it's to them. Um, they've really made it happen. It's been a couple of tough years. They've rallied around. They made sure that they stuck to their guns, done what they need to do and pushed and shoved towards the same direction. And as long as you're pushing and shoving towards the same direction, it all falls in place. It does. Thank you, Vidusha. I wish you, a, you a great weekend. And uh, I look forward to uh, continuing this uh, relationship with you at long distance for time being, but who knows what the future might bring once the uh, borders and everything open up. Well, absolutely. We're truly looking forward to that, Peter. Thank you very, very much. For My pleasure. Me. Mental Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye-bye. I'm back now. As you can see, Vidusha is a salt-of-the-earth guy and such a great debater. There's more than one option to everything he's involved in. And I actually believe there's really no lost column in his books. He reminds me of that great quote from one of my favorite servant leaders, John Maxwell. Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Thanks for listening.